as we ponder on the greatness of God in Jesus Christ, let us turn to our reading of Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. And the word of God says, Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre, Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from the region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away for the sheep, for she keeps shouting after us. And he answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Please pray with me. Dear God, you sent your son Jesus Christ to be the boundary breaker. Help us, God, to be in your presence and to be challenged how we can also have mercies without boundaries. May the word of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to your name. Amen. So there is a play in 1918 written by John, John Drinkwater called Abraham Lincoln. A dialogue takes place between Abraham, the president, and a woman who is an ardent, ardent person who wants the North to win during the Civil War. In the conversation, she asks the president for news of the war, and he replies, there is news of victory. They lost 2,700 men, and we lost 800. The woman was ecstatic. How splendid, how glorious. That's great news. The president was disturbed at her reaction. 3,500 human lives lost. And the woman said, but no, 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 Mr. President, you shouldn't look at it that way. We only lost 800. Those are the numbers that matters. Lincoln's shoulder drooped and tears were seen in his eyes. Madame, the world is larger than your heart. The world is larger than your heart. And I will hope that the world is larger than her heart in whose mind only the lives of those who were on her side mattered. To this northern woman, the tremendous death of those who were on the other side did not matter. If we are honest about this dialogue between the saddened President Lincoln and the woman who only saw it from her perspective, we will find that the woman is representative of every one of us. We also have the propensity to look at life through lenses that separate us and widens the gap between us and them. And in doing that, we make our hearts smaller and smaller. And it seems that we see loss of small hearts all over this narrative, which is, in a way is very disturbing because one of those small hearts belong none other than to our loving and caring Jesus. That's unexpected. 
Did you notice how he responds to the woman who comes begging to cure her sick daughter? First, he ignores her. Yet, when the woman does not give up, the verb is in the imperfect. Remember that. Implying com continuous action. Never give up. Continuous action. And they were bothered by this Canaanite woman. And in a final attempt to get away from the woman or maybe to get her to go away, Jesus tells her something hurtful. Hey, lady, you, can't, you can bug me all you want, but know this. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, Jesus is saying that he came to save the people of Israel and those who are not don't get it, at least not yet. To me, that's ouch. <laughs> this is one of the most painful things I think Jesus says in the Bible. So unexpected of him. What happened to the famous line of John 3.16 where it says, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that everyone whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. What happened to the mercy of God? So some explanation is necessary. I don't think we can just gloss over the seriousness of Jesus' exclusivity and chalk it up as part of the Bible that we just don't understand because it just does not make sense. This text is written primarily for the Jewish people. You know how they say, if you're going to speak or tell a story, know your audience. So Matthew is written primarily for the Jewish audience. And from this perspective, we see that Jesus' beginning of salvific mission is with the Jewish people first. I don't believe that Jesus is being exclusive of all other nations, but he knew what the outcome of this conversation would be. He has foreknowledge of what is to happen. But why did he have to go through the whole conversation and have the poor lady believe that she needs to keep at it so that she never gives up? I also believe that this Canaanite woman's faith does something that no one else has done. Get Jesus to admit that as God's mercy is new every morning, it has no boundaries. And I see that she does it in two ways. First, even as Jesus sets boundaries between Canaanites and Israelites, we see that the boundary is breaking down because the woman came and knelt before him. Knelt is Matthew's code for worshipped. Matthew uses this combination of came and knelt to describe what the synagogue leader, another outsider Gentile, did as he petitioned saving his dying daughter in Matthew 9. It is also the leper, another outsider, because of his illness, who comes and knelt, knelt down and worshiped Jesus in Matthew 8. And last week, we see how the disciples, who were pretty much on the outsider because of their lack of faith and not trusting that the person walking on the water was Jesus, they also knelt and worshipped God at the end. Could it be possible that this recognition of Jesus as the Son of God, as she persistently begs for mercy, touches Jesus' heart, soul, and mind? She believes in him. She called him Son of David. That's a recognition of the divinity of Jesus. But shouldn't that have been enough? How often do we find in the Bible where Jesus says, your faith 
has made so and so well. She believes in him. And she did not get the response at first. Earlier, Jesus had described himself as the good shepherd who came for the lost sheep of Israel. The good shepherd who knows his own and his own know him as well. Could it be that there are others who also know the voice of the Savior? Could this interaction open the boundaries for Jesus' sense of mission growing to include the whole wide world? Secondly, the Canaanite woman engages in an eye-opening theological conversation with Jesus. Even after worshiping and asking for mercy yet again, Jesus tells her that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fair for the outsider of the boundary, for those who are outside of the boundary, to get God's grace. Jesus likens her to a little dog when he has children, other children to feed. She persists and it is with these unexpected, theologically correct outlook that she says, Lord, yes, you are right. But then she continues with the argument that even those dogs get, get the crumbs of those who ate. In other words, what she's saying is that God has enough grace for everyone. There is always an abundance of blessing that doesn't stop at the border of Israel, but overflows to the ends of the earth. This is her theological eye-opening statement to say, yes, you may have come to give grace to the Israelites first, but I believe in the God whose mercy is abundant, overflowing for all of us, even us outsiders. In the two above examples, examples, we see the unexpected woman claiming healing that was not supposed to be for her to claim, changing the narrative with her faith, which in turn helps Jesus and us to realize that mercy is not earned or justified or contained. Mercy is not for those who have the right ethnic passport. Mercy does not require a password or the correct thumbprint. By faith, we believe that mercy is something that to be tapped into and expected because that is the nature of God. Blessing is with us each and every morning. Let me share an illustration from evangelist Luis Palau in the book, Experiencing God's Forgiveness. A mother once approached Napoleon seeking pardon for her son. The emperor replied that the young man had committed a serious crime twice and justice demanded death. But I don't seek justice, my lord, she said. I plead for mercy. But Napoleon said, but your son does not deserve mercy. Sir, she said and cried out, it will not be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is all I ask. Well then, the emperor said, I will have mercy. And he spared the woman's son mercy. This is the mercy that we get from the amazing grace of God. And it is because of this unmerited, undeserved gift of mercy that God pours out to all of us that we are also called to have hearts that are big enough to give mercy without boundaries. We as people of the resurrection, 
we receive mercy through the renewal of life when Jesus rose from the dead. We as people who are called to follow the examples of Jesus are to show mercy even to unexpected people. I know I need mercy day after day from all the people that I encounter and I fail to show undivided love and attention. I just came back from a convocation, clergy convocation, and um, it dawned on me that it was, the theme was on nourish, self-care for clergy, and we had an amazing speaker, Dr. Kirk Byron Jones, and uh, one of the things that he mentioned in his speech, and it just fell upon me like a ton of brick, <laughs> was that I am addicted to hurry and busyness. Growing up with the concept that idleness is not good, I was raised to believe by adults to succeed, you needed to be busy. And if you were not busy, pretend you're busy. So I have learned that I've been addicted to being in a hurry. And one of the things that I've noticed that I need mercy from is that when you're in a hurry, you're not really attentive. You're not in the moment. And one of the things that I've noticed is that being in charge of the whole convocation, I needed to be in 10 different places 20 times a day. So one of the things I've noticed is that I wasn't paying attention to people talking to me because my mind is somewhere else, knowing that I had to be somewhere else doing something else. Hurriedness, business. And I needed their mercy. At the end of the convocation, I went purposely and asked for mercy from people who I knew I was not attentive to when they were talking to me because I would be looking at somewhere else. I'll be doing something else. Inoculus, nothing really that hurt them. It's going to do permanent damage, I hope. <laughs> but still, something that I knew I was failing in being attentive to their needs and being present. The presence, the ministry of presence that is so precious. I know I need mercy every day. Do I deserve it? Many a times, no. But mercy is mercy because it's not something that we may deserve it, but we seek it because we all need to give it around, take and give. We receive it and then we share them. So mercy was given to this young boy that I want to share this story by a famous country singer, Lonzo Green, in the early 1950s. Lonzo Green and his family were visiting relatives in Tennessee, and his nephew Jimmy was so excited that he told all of his friends. And one of Jimmy's friends was especially interested because he loved music. He wanted to learn how to play the guitar, and he liked Mr. Green's music. So he asked Jimmy if he could come over to meet his uncle. Well, Jimmy liked his friend and wanted to please him, but he was in a quandary. You see, his mother always said, you may play with him, but do not bring him home, because as she put it, he was from the wrong side of the tracks and at times had even called him white trash. When Lonzo Green heard the story, he agreed to meet Jimmy's friend outside the house. A couple of hours later, Lonzo Green moved to the front, front step to wait for Jimmy's friend. Soon after, a dark-haired, quiet young man came toward him. The boy was obviously self-conscious about his surroundings, like he knew he did not belong there. Green noticed the boy's guitar obviously very cheap and tethered by a piece of string. 
The young boy smiled and sat next to Mr. Green. Lonzo took the instrument from the boy and noticing that he was not tuned, asked if anybody had taught him to tune his guitar. And the young boy said, no, sir. Lonzo Green tuned the guitar and gave it back to the boy. He saw the young man stand up to leave and felt mercy come all over him. For you see, he had also come from the wrong side of the tracks and often not being invited to the right homes. He knew the pain of knowing that he was not one of them. Lonzo Green called the young man back and set, set him down, took the guitar from him and played song after songs that were familiar to this young man so that he may learn the chords to the song. The evening came and the boy left, never being invited inside. Lonzo Green would never see him again, but the boy left his company with a warm memory and a renewed enthusiasm for music and the guitar. Mr. Green's mercy had made an amazing impact on this young poor boy from the wrong side of the tracks for after 35 motion pictures and millions of records later, Elvis Presley found himself in the homes of all of American people and the world. This Gentile woman showed the commonality of the human condition, that no matter who we are, we are all in need of mercy. The woman in the play engaged in the conversation with Abraham Lincoln only had her heart set for those who were on her side. The Canaanite woman showed the entire world needs mercy and Jesus consents based on her faith and extends his heart to the world. And this impacts how the end of Matthew is. I share with you that Matthew was explicitly purposely written for the, uh, for the Hebrew people, for the Jewish people. It was initially to be Jewish-centric, which ends instead with the disciples being told by Jesus, move out, go from Jerusalem to Samaria, into Canaanite land, and into the world. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Something that started very, very centered in the middle for Israel, it becomes a concentric circle that becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Friends, where are we in our ability to have open hearts? We claim to be people of the United Methodist Church that have open hearts, right? Open doors, right? Open minds, right? So never give up living to those standards. And those are just standards because I think we need to go beyond that and know that the opening of our hearts has to be beyond those who are within our center. It has to go beyond what we consider the wrong side of the tracks. It has to be mercy because otherwise that all that would be just, justice. Mercy goes beyond that. So as we go from day to day, See how it is that we may be able to open our hearts, our minds, and our doors, literally as well as spiritually. And we pray, and I pray, that our hearts be made so much larger with mercy that they will break all boundaries. Amen? And may the grace of God 
be with us as we strive to grow our faith by sharing with mercy with all. Amen.